Finding a Voice, written by Amrit Wilson, is the first book I read that focuses on the specific intersections that I exist at. A second generation British Muslim woman, a daughter of a peasant Bangladeshi migrant. My mum only migrated here in 1991 and was only just born at the time this book was set around. Wilson's aptly named book aimed to give a voice to the woman of the time, but four decades later, I found much of the narrative resonated with my own experience and those that I see in my community is tackling today. She inspired me to add my own voice to capture the details of what we feel is just life happening. So to begin, mum before mum. My mum travelled to London a little after marrying my dad. I do not know much about my father pre-mum. I know he'd been here for a few years prior working in a restaurant. What I don't know is when he came, what his life was like and how he coped. What did he study in college? Did he have any friends? Are they still friends? I don't know much about mum's life prior to being mum either. What was her journey like? What was she hoping for as she left her entire world behind? In 2019, I helped organise an event with Nidra Manoj around the death of al Bali and the way the community responded to this. This inspired me to ask my mum about the experiences of my dada, my great uncle, who had come here before my dad and brought, over, brought him over soon, um, soon after he came. Mum told me about the racist attacks, the poverty, surviving on just bread and water, the struggles with the cold, but also the jokes the men would play on each other, not knowing how to read, they would use chalk to mock the doors on wall on walks, only for the friends to rub them off and watch their friends getting very lost. Dada passed away a few years ago, long before I cared about my heritage, and I have no contact with my dad. These small snippets open up a whole world I had forgotten to even care about. Mum as mum. My mum is a housewife and always has been. When my sister and I were young, before the other two came along, my father would work away from home, only coming back once a week for a night. Mum had, had to manage everything herself. She would put my sister to sleep and run to collect me from school, praying she would still be asleep when she returned. Thankfully, she always was, and nothing terrible ever happened. Dad would leave mum with just £20, or sometimes less, to get by in the week, sending the rest of the money back to his parents and bang, siblings in Bangladesh. My brother was quite sick, requiring regular house visits and hospital visits. Mum handles all of this, despite knowing little to no English. It's strange now how completely reliant she is on us. We wouldn't believe she was doing all of this and everything all by herself 20 years ago. It's likely because as I got older, I took over the translating, becoming very good at managing all the bills and such. I remember moving houses in year five and having to write physical letters to all the banks and other various companies informing them of our change address. Community. Mum made some very close friends. All of the Bengali neighbors were my aunties and uncles. We went to learn Quran in a neighbor's house. I tutored a neighbor's little son, and I accompanied those with young children to doctor's appointments and council meetings. Some of these friends became closer than family. One of these aunts I nicknamed my mom and my second mum. Mum talks to her every day, sometimes several times a day. My mother-in-law, who works as a teacher after arriving here, commented the other day on how she missed out on this community. She thought at the time that her colleagues would become her friends, but everyone had moved on. And she was left with friends scattered all around the UK and Bangladesh, rather than being in a relatively tiny pocket. She noted at the time she felt like she was winning in life, gaining all of these experiences, and now she felt like she had actually lost, lost out on a community. It made me reflect on what my own motherhood would be like, and the subsequent friendships I will be left with 30 years later when the children have, have their own kids. Things feel different now, because everyone works, but maybe that's how she felt at the time too. It's that. Wilson also touches quite heavily on the topic of idot or dignity and how that plays into the perceived and actual role of women. My first memory of this, or rather of me maintaining it, is when I was instructed to stop playing with my cousin, Reed, mum's best friend's son. We'd grown up together playing gladiators and other made up games, and suddenly, when I was in year seven, I was told not to play with him no more. Mum said I would be bedjot or shameless if I continued, and so I stopped and collected that shame. Growing up, I was equally, it was equally difficult and easy. I was a good child and that I didn't bunk school. I dressed as my parents wanted me to and didn't talk to boys. Equally, I did not have to play the good daughter role. I did not have as many chores to do at home, no more, no more than my brother does anyway. Mum did all the cooking and most of the cleaning, and I was given the space I needed to read and write. I was lucky in that sense. There was no fear of forced marriage. My dad abused us, but then again, whose father didn't? It was my mum who was brave enough to get rid of him. 
a few things happened. One thing led to another. Next thing you know, he was gone. We're happy without him. And I know it was a difficult time for my mum. Not because she needed him, but because people felt she needed him. They were worried about me getting married and what others would say. And they were right. Many proposals were turned away when people found out. Recently, a friend of mine who's looking to get married herself was trying to explain the Reacher and Settler theory to me. In doing so, she said, some may say that you're a Reacher, given your family situation. Situation being that my parents were divorced. Never mind that my mom was strong and brave enough to stand up for her children, where many mothers blame their children or ignore the abuse completely. Never mind that my mom was strong enough to stand up against her abuser. And never mind that each of our four siblings are thriving in our respectful sectors, alhamdulillah, and thanks to her guidance and that of our adopted aunties and uncles. Belonging. So finding a voice made me realize my mom's voice was often drowned out by what is best for her children. And my own voice is often drowned out by what's going to make me successful in my mother's eyes. This book gave me a chance to consider my own voices individually, collecting the intricate details that we sometimes just assume is mundane, but I can now see are inherently political. Why do I know so little about such earth shattering changes? Why did my mom have to leave her two year old at home alone to go and collect her three year old from school? What kind of strength is seen as weakness? All in all, it helped me navigate what it means to belong and how you can simultaneously do so whilst being an outsider. Amrit, Amrit found belonging in her political work, utilizing these seamlessly mundane points to pivot her work forward. I hope to do the same, finding grounding in abolition and anti-racist organizing.